We're, we're, we're looking at the boiling down the problems as essentials, and we're looking at the helper's skills of responding and focusing. And as I left off, uh, I was looking at where Stone had mentioned or stated, in establishing a relationship, it is best to respond at first primarily to feelings. As a relationship develops, both feelings and content become increasingly important because the two together reveal the meaning of what is being expressed. For example, Stone says, I hear you saying you feel low reflects a feeling, depression, whereas because you lost your job reflects content, being fired. Only when the two are viewed together is the full meaning apparent. The cause of the depression is recognized when the content is added, the loss of the job. Now, Stone mentioned here the following are additional features of effective response and good feedback. Uh, specificity. He mentioned that vague or general responses such as you are too aggressive or hard for the person to use. Uh, you speak loudly and interrupt others frequently. It's more, it's more helpful feedback. Well, uh, yes. Um, uh, describing the behavior more than uh, speaking in a general way is uh, the best way of doing it. Even when uh, persons are uh, coming to you and they uh, speak in a way that's kind of vague, if you can get them, tell them to give them an example, be a little bit more specific, uh, even to them as such. Uh, and uh, uh, use an open-ended questions. Uh, yes, you want to not have closed-ended questions because closed-ended questions only give you a yes or no. But an open-ended question gives that person's an op person an opportunity to really uh, talk about their situation a little bit more. Uh, a closed-ended question, of course, you know, well, how old are you? <laughs> Twelve or thirty-one, what might be, uh, as, a, as opposed to how do you feel about this situation? Uh, give them more opportunity to elaborate or talk about some things as such. So you want to really uh, talk, uh, think about that. Uh, describing rather than evaluating. Now this is interesting. He said, describing a feeling response to something the person has said is better than putting a label on that statement. Uh, I sense you have a reservation about making these changes rather than you're stubborn. Well, we know which statement sounds okay. If someone said you're stubborn, it's going to be quite a, a little bit offensive to you, okay? But if you say, hey, I sense you have reservations about making these changes, then it gives you a little bit more feeling of, okay, okay, you got some reservations, okay. Uh, not as blunt you know, as such. And when you're speaking to someone who's really very sensitive, uh, emotionally, psychologically, and, and all otherwise due to being in a crisis situation or crisis, uh, that sensitivity is very high. And so the way you frame a statement is very important. Uh, in terms of whether it's going to be helpful or not helpful to that person. And so, therefore, uh, um, responding with immediacy. It is important to give frequent feedback at the appropriate time rather than save it all up for a summarizing conclusion. Uh, I hope that no one really does this. My feelings are in the process of a person uh, talking to you about some things. You need to really give that person, acknowledge those, those things, what it might be. Uh, to give that person hope that something is going on here, something is happening here, uh, rather than wait uh, to summarize everything. The summary could be too extensive for that person to even concentrate on or, or to focus on uh, uh, because they're in a state of crisis. They're not feeling all that great. So they're not uh, in that, that frame to really hear a big summarizing something. But in bits and pieces of giving that person positive feedback Tell what they're saying and what the needs of what it might be. That's the thing that's going to be most effective. Immediate feedback. And brevity. Limiting responses to a sentence or two whenever possible is better than lengthy responses. And that's the, um, very important. Now, I don't know. I hope persons don't come through with sermons as such. And that's a possibility with some ministers. And, as, and I have to watch myself, really, many times. Be short. Make it short and simple. Uh, not a long step of responding. Again, the person is not really uh, being in, due to, to the being in a crisis as such. Uh, they're not in that state to be listening to long explanations. Uh, so you need to have things make things pretty short and really simple for them. 
uh, it is better well, you know, checking for understanding, that's, that's very important. Because really, if any uncertainty remains regarding understanding what you have understood or been understood, correctly inquire about this. <clears throat> and one way that, you, that I do it is that I don't quite understand, you know, what has been said with my BQ, help me to understand what you're saying and so forth and so on. I will ask for clarity if it's something I don't quite understand. Uh, and so just acting if I do, acting if I do, and uh, down the road it might end up backfiring on me, so I need to really check and recheck for understanding. Now, this is something sometimes is very difficult for a lot of ministers or pastors or people to deal with, is pauses. Uh, pauses. It is better to allow lapses in conversation when they occur naturally and not to pepper the dialogue with new questions whenever the person takes a breath. Pause does not only allow the individual to reflect on what has been said, but also give the carer a chance to formulate responses without using variable listening time to do so. Be, and also be aware of the person's uh, way of expressing themselves. Uh, there are individuals uh, who might uh, over a long period of time, they might just have pauses as such, more so than someone who might just talk a little bit faster. And so therefore, uh, but whenever the, the silence comes, whenever there's a pause, what it might be, allow that opportunity. In other words, uh, be comfortable with pauses. Uh, uh, it's okay. And the person will eventually come and finish off what they need to say as such. And so, yes, please allow for pausing, uh, pauses. Uh, the, the, the other skill in terms of boiling down uh, the problem to is essential is focusing. Focusing. Individuals are frequently not fully aware of the precipitating stress and its consequences, and sometimes persons are not. Uh, and so, therefore, the focusing process ends at prompt identification of the nature of the threat, and clarification of the relevant circumstances and conflicts. When the crisis can be defined clearly and the nature of the threat to the person clarified a plan for resolution becomes possible. Indeed, ideally, it would emerge out of the individual's own thinking. And here, the folks can come where, again, like this lady that came uh, into the mental health agency uh, and very much in, uh, 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 just hysterical in a way, where she felt that she was going crazy. Uh, and just looking for somebody to help her. And so therefore, one of the things that was very important is to help this lady focus. And one of the things that she really, in the process of listening to her and, and to her story that she was telling me that what was going on with her, uh, then I got, she made me aware of what the precipitating stress event was. Uh, it just so happened, and in this case here, it was a situation that when she saw this person, is reminded of the time when this person had sexually abused her when she was young. This person had a, had a prominent, prominent position in the ministry. Her father. And so, therefore, it's triggered a lot of things that happened. Uh, and so I saw... And her saying, telling me what it was, we're able to identify what, it, what was going on here as such. And then by uh, identifying what was the precipitator going on here, then of course identifying why these kinds of things that were happening to her, the flashbacks and so forth and on, so forth and on, were really having her feel as if she was going crazy. But I help her focus in a sense and know you're not going crazy. Indications are you're experiencing a crisis. And that helped her to get a little bit more focus here. And then the thing that really helped in her case uh, is that when I had some other female therapists come into the room with her permission, uh, and these were therapists that I knew were very seasoned, well-trained therapists. And these therapists, one of them uh, had an extensive history in working with persons who had been sexually abused. And uh, so therefore, when these ladies came in and she explained to them what was going on, 
I saw how she was bonding with the one who had that extensive experience in trying to work with people who had been sexually abused, especially women. You know? And uh, then that helped her also uh, to really uh, not only get things clear, but at least there's a plan that's taking place here that can happen for resolution or to get her through it. And it just so happened that this lady that she really bought it to, as a matter of fact, we gave her the choice. She chose for this lady to be her primary therapist. Uh, and there was another, another lady in there also that, uh, that she wanted to have work with, but this one lady that was experienced in that area, she chose her to be a primary therapist. And that was now setting up the situation for some type of resolution here, you know, uh, as such. Uh, and so it just so happened that in the end, uh, with the lady working as primary therapist, the other lady working with her, it helped her to get through it. Uh, and uh, so therefore, um, uh, she told me many years later on that, hey, you know, I really felt privileged when I saw all these other therapists coming in, you know, with you, you know, to listen to me. And I said, well, that's great. Yeah. Uh, but at least we have to set up a plan for a resolution uh, for this lady, which happened to resolve uh, some things in her mind and such. Uh, and so, uh, Stone mentioned here, many in Christ are momentarily evading laws and defending themselves against pain. That's part of the helpless task is to encourage them to face up to reality, but have to be very careful with that. Uh, in terms of that, uh, he mentioned that the caregiver creates an environment in which the person feels comfortable enough to confront the crisis and the event that precipitated it. There is in that process of initially dealing with that person, the person catharsis and what it might be, you get down to a level where you're responding, but the focusing part here, uh, you want to really assess to see whether that person is really at this period in time uh, uh, strong enough or uh, in a state where she, they can really deal with or confront the situation. Many times it might be for you as that therapist, which I've had to do, had to work with that individual to a level that they get strong enough that they can confront that which has created the crisis. Uh, at, that, at the initial time, they're not strong enough. They're, they're, in a, what it might be, they're not strong enough to really do that. But in the working with them, such as one lady I worked with who was dealing with a crisis of a divorce, her husband, uh, they were Christians, and her husband decided to want to divorce her for another woman, and so forth and so on. And at that period in time, when she first initially came in, uh, it was hard for her to face that reality of a divorce taking place here. And I cannot believe that my you know, husband is divorcing me, for, divorcing me, period. And, but for, you know, it was hard for her. And so, therefore, at that period in time, uh, she did not have, was not able, at that period in time, to confront that as such. And so, therefore, I had to work with her to get her to that level where she was at face to confront that reality. Yes, it did happen. It has happened. You know, but, and then, of course, uh, utilizing what God put in my heart to convey to her in terms of his word, uh, able to get her strong enough to face the reality of the situation. Uh, and so there are just some persons you have to be very careful with this. I'm certain that uh, uh, Stone is meant well here. Uh, uh, in terms of men in Christ are momentarily evading reality, defending themselves against pain. That's probably help us test encourage them to face up to reality. I'm glad he used the word encourage them to face up to reality because many times they don't have the strength at that time to really do that. You know, that's where you come in in terms of helping them. That's, that's, that's when the Word of God comes in, eventually, to help them uh, to deal with it. You know, where you can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You know, but you can say, great is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Well, you can get to that level you know, and start to face it as such. And then, in focusing, uh, the minister needs to be aware of the following. One, the precipitating event, you need to always be able to identify the precipitating event or the emotional hazardous event or the threatening event. Okay. Uh, the uh, second one, the loss or threatened loss of something or someone important. 
Okay. Number three, the individual's coping methods and resources. And number four, new factors or conditions which may cause his or her traditional methods of coping to fail. And be aware that these, in, in spite of the fact that these are enumerated here and, 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 and stated in the book here, your mind as a computer is going to be going quickly through this, assessing, assessing. And it's trying to quickly assess what, the, what's, what is the precipitating event, so forth and so on. Yeah in the process of that small amount of time that you do have in terms of ministering to that person that's in crisis. Uh, uh, folks, it includes filtering out irrelevant data, person in crisis, sometimes share material that is meaningless to the situation that they do not know is meaningless. Now, he's saying that it's meaningless to the situation, not the information being meaningless itself, but it's meaningless to the situation, especially if you have identified what the precipitator might be. You know? uh, and so, therefore, but they don't know at that period in time, which they don't know, that is, is not useful at this period in time. You know? uh, if a person brings up seemingly unrelated material, the minister can try to relate it to the present crisis or show, or show its irrelevance with a statement such as, I wonder how you see this relating to your immediate problem. You can. Uh, that's open-ended question there. Uh, but at the same time, if you really see it's not really, they're not in that condition to even uh, uh, deal with that, even that statement as such, uh, then you might say, well, uh, yes, we'll, I will get to that. We can get to that later on. At the moment, we want to focus on getting you through this. Okay. So there are certain things that you need to do in terms of assessing where that person is emotionally, psychologically, in terms of crisis, you know, where you might make a determination whether you can have an open in, in a question as, I wonder how you see this relating to your immediate problem, or whether you might need to say, oh, we'll get to that later. You know, at the moment we just want to focus on getting you through this. Okay? And so, uh, uh, I'm, I'm putting some more meat to this, uh, some of the things Stone is saying of my own experience daily in terms of what's going on with people who might be in crisis. Yeah. Um, also, uh, once the situation is accurately assessed, the minister communicates the essence of the dilemma as simply and directly as possible. Now, this communication has been called consensual formulation. Now, this is a term here I want you to become familiar with. Because in the process, you're talking about the boiling down uh, 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 the problem to its essentials, the B part of the ABC method, uh, this word I really want you to uh, seriously consider uh, utilizing and utilizing this method. Uh, uh, so once the situation is accurately assessed, the minister uh, communicates the essence of the dilemma as simply as directly as possible. This communication has been called consensual formulation. The minister and the individually mutually formulate an understanding of what has happened and put it into words. The, dis the distressed person is able to move to the next element of the crisis intervention process, examining alternative methods of dealing with the present crisis, choosing those which seem appropriate and mobilizing available resources. When consensual formulation is not developed, and it may not always be possible, there is less chance for personal growth and learning from the crisis, even though the crisis may be resolved adaptively. And so, therefore, the consensual formulation here is where you, along with the person uh, in the process, in, in crisis, together, you have formulated an understanding of what has happened and is able to put it in words, especially that person is able to put it in words. Yeah. That lady uh, that said, hey, you know, I see what has happened here. You know, when I saw my father, who has a permanent position as a minister, coming in to my church, delivering a message, uh, uh, and just a mere fact of his being, they had created, triggered memories of his having abused me. Uh, and so, therefore, when that happened, that just created all sorts of images in my head to the level that I really thought that I was going crazy. 
Uh, but now I know what happened here. Uh, and so therefore, I know that I have to start to work through the process of dealing eventually uh, with those past abuse issues that happened to me young, as a young child. But at the moment, you know, uh, I do know that I'm not going crazy, I'm not insane. You know? uh, but I know I'm going to need somebody to work with me to help me work through that process in terms of what's happened to my father in the past. Yeah. Uh, and get to that level of, un, uh, of folks and understanding, uh, then that's when you can move forward. Yeah. Uh, so therefore, his stone is correct. Uh, this along the boiling down process, you're not in the first contact. You're over that achieving the, uh, um, a relationship with the person. The A part is, is the, the initial part, but when you start getting down the boiling down part, you might be in week number three or week number four and work with this person. Uh, they've kind of got past the initial stage now where they can focus a little bit more on what's going on here. They've gotten to the emotional part here, the feeling part, the process that. And now you might be in week number three or four. And there are some persons out there, they have really kind of worked through it and what it might be, and yes, uh, they might uh, just drop out of counseling. Might not drop out to church, but might drop out of counseling. And so that's expected. And so they might have ad um, adapted, adapted okay in terms of resolving the, the crisis, uh, but they might not have worked with that consensual formulation sort of issue. And not having done that according to Stone, uh, they've lost the uh, opportunity for personal growth and learning. I don't know, but uh, uh, that can happen. So keep in mind uh, the consensual formulation. Because Stone said the development of a consensual formulation can in and of itself reduce the anxiety level and enhance the self-esteem of the person in crisis. And that is true. Once a person is able to identify, to clarify, and we get a sense of what is going on with them, uh, there is no longer that unknown, and so therefore the anxiety has a way of decreasing. And, uh, and also, it might help that person and, uh, say, well, for goodness sakes, you know, they're being able to do that along with some assistance can make them feel okay about themselves instead of really feeling helpless. Uh, and when you're feeling helpless, but you have no control, or the self-esteem is not all that great. But if that person really comes to really, uh, with this consensual formulation, know what's going on, what's happening, anxiety can, can decrease, and then self-esteem can increase also. Uh, and so, Stone says, consensual formulation accomplishes the basic purpose of crisis counseling, namely to help the person pull out of the tailspin. Uh, and that's very important. You know, at any time, you know, when a plane where it might be is going into a tailspin, that's danger, danger, danger. In some way, somehow, if they're not pulling out, can't pull out, it's a crash. Yeah. And uh, the unfortunate part is that there are some persons who have gotten into a tailspin, you know, and are not able to then get an assistance in terms of pulling out. Many times they have crashed. Yeah. And so, therefore, uh, we've looked at the A part in terms of Stone's ABC method, and we're looking at the B part of Stone's ABC method, and then now we're going to look at the coping actually with the problem, the C part. And you'll find out that this, this Stone's ABC method of crisis intervention is a very simplistic method, uh, but it says quite a bit. Uh, uh, and, uh, and that's the interesting part. It's, it seems very simplistic, which is good, you know, because you need to have something that's basic and a framework that's basic and pretty simple, uh, and then work from there in terms of ministering to somebody, especially who's in crisis. And so the C part is coping actively with the problem. So in the final stage of ABC method, ministers help those in crisis evaluate and mobilize their resources develop a plan of action, and make specific changes directed toward resolving the crisis. The ultimate goal of all helping is action. 
such as making a decision, accepting a loss that cannot be changed, learning a new skill, or finding a job. Thoughtful yet decisive action leads to growth. And this is something that I cannot emphasize enough in terms of persons need to take action. They need to do something in terms of their situation. And this is not only in terms of crisis counseling intervention, this is in, in terms of any kind of counseling, be it short-term or long-term counseling. One of the things that need to happen for things to really be resolved in a healthy way and for their growth to be, for growth to come about, the individual must do something, must take action. Uh, and so therefore, one of the things that work against the therapeutic process is that people talk about it, drop it, dump it, and don't take an action. And so therefore, the things come back again. Right. And so therefore, knowing what the problem is but unable to find a solution is a common difficulty for those in crisis, yet it's useless to boil down the problem if the person does not take action. Right. So they need to take action. Each pastoral care requires a systematic model or models in order to help people weigh alternative, make decisions, and take the first step toward problem resolution. Problem management methods are based on assumption that merely communicating about a problem, expressing one's feeling about it, are not always sufficient. In some cases, the problem persists. For example, the alcoholic husband who continues beating his wife whenever he drinks until the person takes action and begins to make responsible choices, nothing is going to improve here. Nothing. You know. And so therefore, as Stone says, the minister needs to help those in crisis examine alternative courses of action with which they can take to reshape their lives. And then needs to challenge them to act upon one or more of those alternatives. Such problem management usually has five components. Establishing goals, taking inventory of resources, formulating alternatives, committing to action, and evaluating. Now this is all come, comes under the, uh, the C, coping activity, uh, in terms of co coping actively with the problem, establishing goals. And Stone mentioned that ideal at this point in the ABC method, the minister has established a relationship. And hopefully around about this time, this is the latter part, uh, because you know that the uh, the maximum amount of time in terms of crisis uh, that you need to have that is that of really uh, six weeks, in all honesty. Uh, because in all honesty, within that time before that's up, within that time, the person is going to find some way, be it adaptive or not adaptive, of uh, uh, dealing with that crisis. And so you, you, you have a time limit here. And so by the time you get down to the C part, coping actor with the problem, Yes, hopefully you have established a relationship with that person from the depth of different uh, sessions you've had with that person and getting them through the initial part of the crisis. And so therefore, established relationship, you know, you've allowed the person to express their feelings and not only express their feelings, allow the person in a, a process of expressing feelings to process those feelings. You know, find out what those feelings are, are about, what they are. You know, find out how those feelings are impacting you as, as, you know, in terms of that uh, precipitate of your Christ, what it might be. So process the feelings. Uh, also, uh, and uh, help the person boil down and define the problem. That's very important. The next task uh, uh, is uh, to establish goals. And make it very simple. My idea is when you, you're looking in terms of establishing goals, make it very simple. Something that could be attained, attainable, uh, uh, that won't take weeks or months to attain. You know? uh, uh, if it's nothing more than you were this lady, you know, that was, uh, that had decided, you know, to have one of the person as a primary therapist. Um, one of her uh, goals probably is hopefully, you know, to be able to at the moment you know, get her life focused in terms of her day-to-day -day activity, you know, uh, because I know she'd become pretty mobilized in terms of even doing some basic things in terms of housework or work, what it might be. One of the goals is to be able to walk out of my house and go to work <laughs> and be responsible, you know, 
If I'm having some problem with that, well, I'll talk about therapy, what it might be, but at least do that. Because in all honesty, it's going to take some time to resolve uh, issues of sexual abuse, abuse that happened many years ago. Uh, that now in her 40s or what it might be, uh, she's now having flashbacks, flashbacks about. Uh, so do something really attainable and simple in terms of establishing her goals. Uh, because if you don't, you're going to find yourself going round and round and round and round and round and round and you as well as the, uh, the person that you're working with is going to feel pretty uh, frustrated as such. So make the goals very uh, simple. Uh, Changing the focus of helping from negative problems, problems to fo uh, positive goals is the first step. Now, this is interesting here. I know that there are uh, some um, therapists now who are looking in terms of, uh, instead of problem-focused, you know, uh, as such, uh, they are looking in terms of things being solution-focused. There are some therapists who are looking at that. And I think that's pretty good. Yeah. Uh, in terms of that. In other words, we don't get caught in a problem in terms of defining things. We get, we get into the solution in terms of how to resolve these, these situations. And, uh, and it falls in, in terms of uh, where we know our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ can help us through all things. That's part of the solution <laughs> you know, as, as such. You know? So mostly solution-oriented than problem-oriented as such. Uh, but Stone says, once some general long-term goals are stated, it is important to develop specific what I've just said. Short-term, easily attainable objects, objectives toward which the problem song would be aimed. For example, if the problem is that a void was created when a couple's last daughter joined the Air Force and moved to another country, the goal is to find new tasks, meaning now that the nest is empty and only long-distance parenting is required. One object objective may be to start up the mail order business they had talked about for years but never seemed to have time to put into operation. That's very simple. Okay. Then the next mess syndrome. Uh, okay. Do something that you, you said. You want to get on it. You know. So the goal determines the direction in which the care will proceed and toward which the course of action will be aimed. It's always best to be as specific as possible in defining goals to express them in observable terms. It is far more helpful to establish small and short-term aims we said that before attain them than to set up lofty long-term goals that may not be reached and will bring disappointment. Most of the useful goals in crisis counseling should be attainable in a matter of weeks. Uh, that's why I would say the situation uh, with the ladies, it becomes mobilized. One of the things that, that she could do is find herself getting out of that house and going to work. Uh, and uh, that's something that uh, can happen, attainable, and can be some uh, direct feedback for immediate feedback. Uh, and that's a start. Yeah. Uh, of course, you take an inventory of resources, and that's very important. <clears throat> After your goals have been uh, delineated, ministers will need to help individuals take inventory of their internal and external resources. And that's very important. People in Christ sometimes have trouble reviewing their resources rationally, and the minister may have to take the lead. Uh, as a matter of fact, when there are some people in crisis, they really don't even, are not aware or even cognizant of what strength they do have. Uh, most of the time, they are aware of the fact what they can't do. You know? And so, uh, in, internal resources are those methods of coping which each person has developed and upon which he or she can draw in the face of daily problems. Sometimes people are not aware of their internal resources. And that's where that takes them a... Uh, observation on your part, some listening on your part, uh, you are not only observing, but you're also listening for strengths, you know, and, term, and you're going to focus on those strengths as such uh, while you're listening. Uh, he, Stone says the minister needs to point them out by saying, for example, you say you can't tell people what you feel, but I see you're doing a great job of telling your feelings to me. That's a strength, you know. Uh, one significant internal resource is experiencing of, of handling past crises in the process of persons talking to you. Uh, uh, you can hear what they're, they're saying and so forth and so on, and maybe out of the, the, the conversation or the talk, uh, they've related how they've, some past uh, crises that they've experienced and gotten through. Yeah. Well, for goodness sakes, you want to focus on the fact that, hey, you got through that. Yeah. 
and uh, and then some of the persons uh, definitely can really say, hey, yeah, you know, uh, and by the grace of God and, and the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, I made it through with their help. Yeah. And so, therefore, yes, uh, you've had some in the past, and so, therefore, from that, you know, you made it through, uh, which also indicates also to you at this period of time you can make it through this one. Uh, those, those are strengths. But now, external resources. Now, this is something you better have heads up on. Uh, unfortunately, I'm finding in my doing a lot of cons consultations with persons at different uh, know health agencies that are dealing with families, uh, that there are a lot of persons who are not, even though they have the resources in their communities, a uh, community, uh, what it might be, a lot of persons are not utilizing those resources. Uh, and, uh, and that's why, in all honesty, I direct the therapist and a counselor to really make those resources available to that per per those persons, help those persons to start becoming aware of those resources and utilize those resources. Uh, because I said, external resources include friends, family, church, community group, and finances. People who are in crisis often pull away from meaningful interpersonal involvement and feel lonely. A relatively modest degree of concern on the part of others often is enough to exert a great deal of positive influence upon those in crisis. The support that a now lost relationship had offered may be gained through contact with a new significant person or through the strengthening of a pre-existing relationship. One of the things that I see that's happening that's a very strong resource for a lot of people and uh, that's in crisis having been a church. Uh, a very a good resource, and I have really many times in my consults with people in these mental health agencies have asked uh, the persons, you know, are they connected with the church? Is the family connected with the church? You know, uh, and so many cases they're not, and then we look where do they live, what area do they uh, they're staying in, and then we think about okay, what are some of the churches that's located in that area? You know, and um, many of the times, the areas that, that we look at or consider, uh, 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 many of the churches, uh, most of most of the some of the churches I know, they're pastors, uh, the pastors of the churches, and so therefore I definitely encourage those persons to make connection with the church. Uh, well, we have other resources like Al Davis Boys and Girls Club and so forth and so on. Yes, you know, and those are be utilized also but also make the connection with the church that can be a very strong and supportive resource for that individual, uh, especially when they're going through uh, a crisis as such. As a matter of fact, I find that when you're going through a crisis, the best place for you to be is in, in the church. Uh, really. And uh, I, I found that from my own experiences as such. So that's a good place to be. And God takes it from there <laughs> when you really do that. Those who are emotionally close to a person and quite frequently need pastoral care as well. Uh, and that's a fact. Uh, uh, just don't assume just because it's one person that you're administering to a, that's going into a crisis, that's about it. Be aware of the fact that their family members also can be experiencing a crisis along with them. Many times that's, that's, that's happening. And sometimes uh, these people also uh, need some special guidance. Uh, in support. Might not necessarily be for the minister, but they do need it. Uh, persons lose track of fact that many times, uh, of course, parents or families lose track of fact. Many times when uh, one of the person or family is going through a crisis, many times they lose track of fact that the kids go through some crisis too. You know, uh, you know I mean, there are a lot of young people uh, who related to me in terms of uh, their experiencing anxiety and so forth and so on in terms of what's going on with, with dad or mom, you know, that's going through some hard times. And so therefore, yes, other family members could definitely be experiencing a crisis. And we know when there's a death in a family, it impacts the whole family. Uh, and one of the things that I always tell persons, I said that, well, well when one in the family hurts, everybody hurts. Yeah. And so, therefore, it's very important for us to find ways to help the family feel better and not to hurt. Uh, and so, there are, it's important many times even, again, for some members of the family. Uh, I already get the family to pray together, that would be great too in terms of going to church, but, you know, also, uh, 
be aware our heads up in terms of that's not just not that one person experiencing that crisis is hurting. You know, there are the members in that family that's hurting also that need some help also. And, uh, and of course, we, he talks about, which is very good, in terms of uh, 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 <coughs> uh, here an organized program of lay pastoral care involving people in the congregation who are capable and willing to move into crisis situations are uh, not frightened by them can be of great help. And this is one thing that you want to keep in mind, ministers and pastors, in terms of you can also have an organized uh, program of lay care, persons of, of your lay persons uh, trained in crisis intervention and crisis counseling. And that would really take a lot of the stress off the pastor because now you can have some persons, lay persons within your congregation that you can call upon uh, to help minister to somebody in crisis. You might be tied up into uh, in a meeting, what it might be, and going, it might be you have somebody, you know, your associate ministers, yes, but also your person within your congregation. And, and that's an advantage because those persons in your congregation are uh, themselves going through certain types of crises. And so, therefore, there's somebody in the congregation who might have experienced in the past uh, the sort of thing that this person is experiencing now is going through a crisis. You might have a group of them. You know, and so, therefore, it can be given that support as such. But you want to make certain that they are also pretty much trained. You just don't send them off on the people. There has to be some training in terms of lay persons uh, and dealing with persons who are experiencing crises. Uh, and so that's, that's, that's a good concept for some ministers to do have this uh, training for their lay persons in crisis intervention. Uh, he goes on to say individual in Christ can find additional support in ongoing fellowship, a prayer group within the church, the worship and occasional services of the church, a film service, confession, or an order for the blessing of a civil, civil, civil marriage may also offer an important resource in a crisis. And he said even in the most remote rural areas, community resources are probably available in times of crisis, and that's true. No matter how remote uh, some places are, you know, there are still some support, uh, so there are some resources that can be available to persons who are in crisis. Uh, um, and so he goes on to mention about uh, even ordinary people may be marshaled to lend a hand, raise money, give blood, sit with the bereaved. Uh, individuals who have recently been in counseling are best referred back to the same counselor want to carefully evaluate protests such as she didn't help me be accepted, uh, before accepting them at face value. One thing I do is that when I have a person who might find themselves complaining about a counselor or a minister that did not help them, I do not really feed into that. You know, we, we focus on what can happen now, what can we do now, uh, in terms of your getting your help, uh, uh, more so than the person that did not help you, you know, or you get, we don't, I don't, I don't get into that, you know. Um, and uh, people in Christ also may resist listing uh, as resources those whom they feel are willing, unwilling, or unable to help. Others often become irritated by the whining, dependency, depression, and helplessness that crisis sometimes bring out in people. Uh, but they are more likely to mobilize if the minister can make them see the extent of the need and their potential for offering support. But that's where the training comes in. That's where the training comes in in terms of persons really come to really uh, get a feel in terms of the needs of this person in crisis so they won't find themselves irritated by the whining or what it might be that might come about. <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, uh, therefore, one task in crisis intervention is to help these significant others care for the troubled person as effectively as possible. Uh, and, and that's what you're looking at anyway, in terms of not only help the person to be able to really generate uh, their own sort of internal resources, but also help that person to be able to utilize uh, outside uh, resources, uh, community resources, church, or what it might be, uh, but also that person to really become connected, you know, with others uh, hopefully, the body of fellow believers, you know, who can really help them through uh, not only this crisis situation, but many situations as such that they have to deal with. And uh, also, the next step is formulating alternatives. Now, one of the things that I have you do, I'm certain, is 
uh, advise all persons to do is you need to really make a list of resources that are you feel that might be available within your community. Uh, these resources do come in handy. Uh, it's good to have that available. Uh, why? Because an individual who comes to you that's basically in crisis and having a hard time and needs some ready uh, help, some, some help now immediately, it's good to have those resources that you can pull out you know, and call or have the person call you call and I was making that connection, uh, to make that connection. Uh, that's why it was very important with this gentleman uh, that was in crisis uh, because of really not being able to get a job because of a bad uh, background check that came uh, up about him. Uh, he was feeling uh, hopeless, helpless, uh, very discouraged, and uh, I really felt that he was going into a some, somewhat depression, deep depression, and possible suicide mode. And so the thing that really um, uh, I really was, wanted to know from him what could what would be immediately helpful for him uh, to start him on the road to getting stable. And he had mentioned that, well, I, they're about to kick me out of my apartment uh, because I'm not able to pay my rent. And so therefore, I need help in that area. And I happen to have available my resources, and I was able to call uh, some pastors with his permission. I said, okay for me to call some pastors. It just so happened that one of the pastors I called, I identified, I, I said, his name, he said, I said, this is, uh, you're indicating that this is this your pastor. I said, he said, yes. I said, well, do you mind my calling your pastor? You know, and of course, I made a call to several pastors, but this pastor here, his pastor, when I present the situation, present the situation as pastor, as pastor, sure, we can write out a voucher for what it might be and pay it, which the pastor did. Uh, and of course, again, God has a way of giving me feedback and telling me certain things uh, because a few years later, the guy came uh, back uh, and um, uh, he, had, he had his master's in education and was teaching, you know, and was very, gave me his card and stuff and uh, let me know how helpful that was in terms of just that uh, immediate uh, thing that was done uh, and to reach the pass the resource to pay his rent uh, was something very significant that him to have him to start on the road to stabilizing. So therefore, it's good to have a resource list a uh, person that you can call, that you feel that you can rely on to help somebody that's in crisis. Uh, <clears throat> and so, because it could save a life. Uh, so, uh, after developing goals and re reviewing resources, administering the person in crisis, brainstorm alternative course of action that might facilitate these goals. Uh, and, of course, you can always encourage the person to develop their own alternatives. And both good and bad ideas are included on the list of, uh, of ideas. For example, a suicide individual include committing suicide as an option. Well, I wouldn't put that on there myself. Okay. That's just my sort of deal, okay. Uh, I, I, there's a little bit more, I have a little bit more hesitant to do that as such. Okay. Uh, uh, my deal is that... Um, um, uh, there are some persons, a uh, level of, of, uh, of development maturity, what it might be, uh, some persons could uh, uh, not interpret this too well. <laughs> okay, it's kind of like one therapist was telling his family that they need to fight more. Okay, with the impression that uh, it would have the opposite effect, that they would not fight. But it just so happened that this family took this therapist literally, literally and went and started fighting more. <laughs> and so <laughs> that was a good, that was a good suggestion, okay? <laughs> and so therefore you have to really watch certain things, you know. So I wouldn't even do this in terms of putting down uh, community suicide as an option. Uh, the caregiver can draw the person thinking by suggesting course of action they would never have considered. This is not a matter of advice given, but an attempt to broaden the horizon of the persons who may still be cognitively constricted and who cannot think of alternatives 
In almost every case, the individual person chooses the course of action to take. Uh, there are some persons who think in black and white. Uh, it's either this or it's either that. Uh, it's either everything is gained or all is lost. Uh, and so, therefore, in all honesty, you have to work with those persons in terms of looking at, oh, yeah, there's more. It's not just not, there are some alternatives here, you know, that is just made available to you. Of course, some people in Christ you definitely can't think, but you should, along this line here, you think it should be a lot clearer now, okay, where the person can say, oh, okay, one of the things I need to start doing is learning. Uh, to list some alternatives here, looking at some alternatives in terms of dealing with situations. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and so, from the list of alternatives, the minister and the person in crisis read out all the relevant and unworkable course of action. For example, the single mother who feels pressured by the responsibilities of home, three children, and a full time job may not be able to quit her job and stay home. If she has no other means of income, such a course would be impossible even if it were desirable. Okay? The person in Christ who worked with the minister to evaluate the remaining choices, the task is to weigh these options against the individual personal values, money, free time, job. If a particular alternative would violate several of his or her values, it can be eliminated as not, eliminated as a non-viable alternative. Uh, the man who is having financial problems but values his work in the church, his free time and family will certainly reject the idea of a second job as a breach of those values. After weighing courses of action in terms of values, the minister and the counselor consider each other's, each course of potential effectiveness. Will it lead to the chosen goals? After the counselor has considered the potential effectiveness of each alternative, the minister can step in and share information from his own experience. Now, that's interesting, too. But this is the latter part in terms of the counseling process, uh, when you will have the person work through some things. Now you're looking in terms of a coping part. Uh, and here, there is a time in, a, in the counseling process, but you've got to get your timing just okay. The only way I get my timing just okay is not from the ex a lot of experiences in terms of counseling, but also when I feel that I'm being led by the Spirit of God in terms of okayness. Uh, because there are some times uh, when you can share uh, a little bit from your own experience. There are some times, there are times, there's an opportune time for that. You know. uh, as I always tell persons, there's a time when uh, you can tell in the counseling process that it's time to look at the ending of the counseling process. Uh, now, Christ intervention is a short one here. Uh, and even that's the time where you can tell when it's about time to really uh, call it, you know, pull out. If the person needs further counseling, I uh, refer as such, uh, but the time to pull out. Um, I always tell persons in the counseling process, if you find uh, persons um, uh, your, yourself after many sessions, uh, all of a sudden you find that you're now chit-chatting just speaking about what it might be, then it's about time for you to start to winding it up. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the time to start to winding it up. You know? uh, and a lot of people don't pay attention to that. And so therefore, it's no longer therapy or counseling as such. It's kind of like conversation. You know? uh, and so it's just uh, needs to be looked at there. So after reviewing the various course of action, individual in Christ need to choose one or two upon which to embark. General urging on the part of the minister may be required. I frequently, Stone says, I frequently find it valuable to write down the commitment on a paper, piece of paper for myself and have constant write it down as well. This is kind of a way of contracting in a way. I don't do it myself. You know? Of course, at one time, God had to really uh, teach me a lesson that many times it comes in handy. Uh, many times it can be useful to have uh, some things written down, you know, on paper, you know, uh, and, and, and have the persons commit to what they write down on paper also. And so, therefore, there's a time when this does come in handy. Uh, 
they make a covenant to begin doing the chosen alternative before the next visit and thus embark on taking small, concrete steps toward achieving their goal. Now, as I say, I, haven't, I don't use that, but it does work. But at the same time, it could backfire on you too. Because in all honesty, uh, when the person feels that, hey, you know, I've not really done what I need to do in terms of doing this, they don't show. They have no shows. Or they cancel. And you wonder why. But if you know of this, uh, oh, I can figure out why he probably didn't show because he probably didn't do this. <laughs> okay? Uh, be aware that there are situations even you get the person through a crisis as such, um, to the um, coping part, uh, there are times when persons might start the counseling and no showing. And that should not cause you to wonder what you've done wrong. Uh, uh, but it should cause you to say, okay, is it time for this? Have we gone beyond uh, the time uh, uh, for a person who's gone, who was in crisis? And, uh, and so therefore, but I tell persons that in the process here of any kind of counseling, you are working toward that person uh, becoming self, uh, uh, able to themselves work through things. You, hopefully that you can really work with them to work through the problem themselves. Okay, you're not... You don't want a condition where the person becomes dependent upon you to resolve or solve things for them. So you don't want to uh, create a, a person develop dependence upon you. You want the person to start to learn how to really themselves uh, work through problems and deal with situations. That's what you want. But persons unexpectedly many times uh, interact with an individual in crisis or in a counseling situation where the person end up becoming de dependent upon them. And you don't want that. You don't want that. The ultimate thing you want them to be able to do is become dependent upon the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, you're leading them to a walk into the valley of shadow death with them uh, and putting their hands in the hands of Christ. He said, this is a sure deal for you here. Okay? And that's what you want to do. Uh, committing to action. After the commitment, action must be immediate, and that's important. But this is the part here that a lot of people won't do sometimes. They will not actually do it. Uh, they want to talk to you about it, but they don't want to do it. Uh, uh, so this step is valid because it helps uh, reverse any tendency of ongoing dependency, dependence of the counseling on the helper. Action counters the paralysis of crisis, encourages people to do something about their problems, whether they feel like it or not. And this is an important statement, whether they feel like it or not. O. Hobart Mara states, it is easier to act your way into a new way of feelings than to feel your way into a new way of acting. That was quoted in Klein Bell in 1966. Page 171. Or in Kleindell's words, the person's personality or self is like a muscle. When you use a muscle, it grows stronger. If you don't use the muscle, the muscle began to atrophy and waste away. The resumption of personal control sometimes comes slowly, but it is accomplished over time. Yeah. And really want to keep in mind, I don't know what they said later on here, but don't do anything for anyone that they can do for themselves. that they can do for themselves. Uh, helpers need infinite patience. Sometimes people in Christ resist at this point and will forget or not have time to begin acting on their chosen alternatives. They may be trying to make the helper angry in order to justify breaking out the relationship. Such resistance needs to be aired immediately and addressed. And yeah, and certain sort of behaviors that you might see going on here, uh, certain behaviors uh, will give you clues as to where you are in this phase of counseling with that person. My ideal is that when you find uh, a certain level of resistance starting to happen in terms of your counseling with that person, resistance as such, strong, then 
is telling you that person is definitely out of the crisis phase. That's a clue. Mm -hmm. That's a clue. They're out of the crisis phase. As a matter of fact, if you find a lot of resistance uh, at the beginning, examine that because it might not be a crisis that the person's in. Because of one of the things that's going to really define and really give you a feel of whether this person's in crisis, really, is heightened psychological accessibility. That person is really open to the help that you're offering to them. Heightened psychological accessibility. That's another word you have to keep in mind. That's a unique part, uh, that's, that's the uniqueness of crisis uh, intervention here. That's psych is heightened psychological accessibility. So if you find resistance at the beginning, check it out. It might not, the person might not be in a crisis. No. Those who are being helped should not be allowed to slide by without re at least recognizing their conduct. Here, in a way, Stone is making statements. This is a time here, in any kind of, crisis, in any kind of counseling situation, there is a time for confrontation. Okay. You don't do it at the beginning, no, because you don't, you're just establishing a relationship as such, you know. But as you go on and, and the person begins to trust you more and you, and uh, the relationship has been established, but based on that relationship that you have that's positive, hopefully, if it's not, the person's not going to stay with you anyway, you know,